we have just entered now here in June our 12th month without a budget in Illinois. Governor Rauner called uh, the latest session a stunning failure. Ray, what does that failure mean for ordinary Illinois residents? Well, eventually there could be ripple effects throughout uh, major issues that people on the street care about. And that could mean we don't open schools on time. We don't have money to 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 just get kids into the places that they need to be so they can learn the basics to move on in life. That's a setback. That's a major setback for the entire city. And Sherry, uh, when Springfield is so dysfunctional, who gets hurt the most? Well, I think that it's pretty obvious that disinvestment in the communities of, of the black and brown people of the state has already created a situation where we have uh, a booming underground economy because the residents of those areas cannot um, access the jobs that are available in, this, in the city and the state right now. Um, so this further lack of investment in our schools, uh, we already know the funding formula is broken. We already know that we need to do something about that. Um, this further lack of investment and the specter of the fact that maybe schools won't open in the fall, that's, uh, that's horrific. And it's just a tragedy that our, governor, our governance all of them would think that this is okay to do. Well, David, just today, the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools, Forrest Claypool, said that not only Chicago schools may not open in the fall, but schools across the state may not open in the fall. Is that a realistic possibility? You would think not, but yeah, as uh, people have said, although we haven't had a budget for over a year and it is drastically having negative effects on certain segments of the population. The one thing everyone understands is if kids don't have a place to go to school, it affects everyone. But at this point, unlike last year when there was a budget that the governor vetoed, but there was a separate K through 12 that he was able to sign to keep the, the, the schools open. At this point, there's no bill on the governor's desk to even open the schools on in August. And if schools don't open, does that become the point of political pressure? Well, I think that what we've seen in the past, and we go back a couple of decades here, is that there have been crises that have pushed lawmakers to go back to Springfield before the schools uh, doors, before the school doors don't get open. And they will go back and get a solution. That is a pressure point. That's a real pressure point. And last year, people were talking about, well, if the schools don't open, then Governor Rauner signed the education bill and the schools opened. So there wasn't the pressure point. But uh, this is a prospect that lawmakers and the governor, neither one really wants to see uh, this tragedy happen here. And stringing it out just makes it even worse, makes them look bad going into an election. Right, and I, and I think that it's more than just our K through 12 schools. We know what happened this year with the state schools and the funding of the universities, the colleges. And that also has long-term tragic effects on our ability to create a workforce and consumers in our, in our uh, state and in our city. Um, how, do, how do we start to uh, uh, com compare what we expect going forward and what, we, what the reality will be if, we, if they continue to play chicken with uh, the funding for schools? Governor Rauner's rhetoric uh, in the last few days has been particularly uh, harsh. In fact, he blamed Democrats for creating what he called a banana republic here in Illinois. Let's listen to the governor. Under the Democrats' control, we have the highest deficits, the highest debt, the highest unfunded pensions of any state in America. Under Speaker Madigan's Democrats, we have the highest unemployment rate of any state in America. Under Speaker Madigan's Democrats, we have the highest property taxes of any state in America. Under Democratic control, we lead the nation in people leaving the great state of Illinois. We have to change direction. And David, Governor Rauner is going around the state now trying to sell that message. What do you think he hopes to accomplish? Well, I think in, in the month of May, most observers will, will agree that he has made some compromises. And in his mind, he thought once he was willing to make these compromises, open up to new revenues, even a tax increase, to get a couple, you know, minor business reforms, that he would have a deal. So I think he's, you know, knows that by nature, people tend to blame the guy with the biggest title, and that's the governor. So I think 
he needs to be proactive to avoid, you know, the so-called wearing the jacket, and, that, and that's what he's going to do right now. One of the things that he's doing is sort of pitting the rest of the state uh, against Chicago, Sherry. Mm -hmm. He's saying that, look, you don't want to vote for a Chicago bailout. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, and here's the thing. That's politics. Uh, the reality is what's happening to the people who are the recipients of the programs that are being cut and not funded. Um, we already know uh, what's happened to a number of different social service agencies that, that provide required services for those with mental illness, uh, for those who are in need of daycare, who, uh, for parents who have to go to work and put their children somewhere so that they can get to work. Um, this is, uh, you know, it's unconscionable. I, I just think that this M&A model where you say, well, slash and burn until everybody gives in, doesn't work in governance. And it's not uh, right. Uh, it's not the right way to govern. It's not the way uh, it's, you know, we've had years of Republican and Democratic governors in the mess that we've made now. So uh, everybody digging their heels in and saying we're going to do one thing and it's going to fix everything going forward, it's unrealistic. It's going to take years. At the same time, Ray, is there some evidence that Madigan's power is beginning to crack? He tried to shove this huge budget bill uh, through the Senate. Senate Democrats basically, some of them, abandoned him and he couldn't even get it through the Senate. Well, I think that's part of a pattern. It's not just a one-time deal here. Senate Democrats have been tired of seeing Madigan throw his budget or his plans over to the Senate and accept, uh, expecting them to vote for it. Uh, he gave them several days to work on it. They could have come up with a counter proposal. They came back with a short-term stopgap measure, but they didn't come back with an overall budget. They sent him, uh, they sent the House uh, an education bill only, uh, one that if the House had gone along with, we might have been able to uh, avoid this kind of showdown in, uh, in August with the schools. But right now, the Democrats want to, and the Democrats in the Senate want to let Speaker Madigan know they're a co-equal House, that he isn't uh, the top House, that they're equal. And unfortunately, that's a test of wills. There's some thought that Madigan is trying to hold out until this election in the fall, David, or could he even be trying to hold out until 2018 when there's a new election for governor? Yeah, I think the thought is he's done his political calculus, and, you know, most people definitely recognize he's, his political calculus has been good over the years. He thinks the guy at the top takes the blame, the CEO is the governor, and he doesn't f fear, you know, having to uh, lose seats in the fall for no other reason because of who the Republicans have at the top of the ticket will not probably play very well in the suburbs. One winner, if you can call it this, in this whole debacle appears to be Chicago Mayor uh, Rahm Emanuel. Both houses overrode uh, the governor's veto of a bailout for the Chicago Police and Firefighters Pension uh, Plan. Ray, is this good for Chicago taxpayers? Well, in the short term, yes. In the long term, it's very costly. They'll pay more. They'll pay maybe billions more. But um, the reality is that you have to get something done now. You can't uh, really unspool this whole mess in just one or two moves. This is a move that for the short term and uh, for the immediate uh, budget crunch that the city is experiencing is best for taxpayers. Even though, Sherry, um, it's going to extend the payments that the Chicago is going to have to put into the police and fire pension over many years. Yeah, and, and we haven't even started to talk about what's going to happen with the teacher's pension and with uh, the, the funding of the public schools in the city of Chicago. Again, I just think that we have to get locally, um, statewide, and nationally compromise. We need to have our legislators govern. They were put there by people who are suffering the effects of them not doing their jobs. David, does this give Mayor Emanuel some breathing room, and was it a good idea? Well, he absolutely needed to have it for the short term, but as Ray said, from what I know about it, all it does is move the bigger payments back. Somebody else is going to have to deal with it at some point, but um, he uh, gets the short-term relief he needed. Well, Chicago just had the largest tax increase in its history, almost $800 million. So if this bill had not gone through, uh, Chicago, I assume, would have been looking at another big right. tax hike. Mm -hmm. and well, absolutely, and, and that's what Mayor Emanuel was trying to avoid. Um, there's still, the taxpayers are still going to be uh, shelling out a lot, but he was trying to get a partnership to get the 
the city uh, employees, the teachers, to give a little bit, get uh, the administration, his administration, to give a little bit, get a little help from the state, and they could build a partnership to try to move forward. But if they hadn't, it would have been more of a doomsday scenario that Emmanuel did not want to happen. Yeah, no, and I think that we have to recognize that nationally, when people look at Illinois and at Chicago, our, our ability to fund and to move forward is really at junk bond status. And we don't have um, any way out of that, and we're kind of a laughing stock. And it really is time for them to start thinking about what are the creative ways that we can solve this problem. And as I said, it's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. It's not one bill. It's not one vote. It's going to be a number of different things that we have to do over a long period of time, because that's how we got here. David, when Governor uh, Browner vetoed this provision for Chicago police and fire, Mayor Emanuel was visibly angry. Does this fray, seriously fray, the, the personal relationship that Emanuel and Rauner seem to have enjoyed? Yeah, I mean, there's the term frenemies, which uh, you can frenemies. see a lot about the... Uh, <laughs> about uh, them and you know I think we all at Thanksgiving you know with family probably have some similar relations but I do think both of them know that Chicago for the state to succeed I think the governor knows that Chicago also needs to succeed and he's been committed on things like you know the school funding reform um, the governor has said that that is something that he wants to do he's involved in education before he became governor I think that's where they'll find some common ground and this will be uh, something they can joke about maybe in the future. What, where do you see the tipping point? Where do you see state residents, you know, if not, you know, having their pitchforks out, at least getting them out of the closet? Well, I think that they're already uh, sharpening the pitchforks right now. The problem is that it's hard to make a difference, particularly with the way that the legislative districts are drawn. So we saw two years ago that Republicans had a shot nationally because of the mood to pick up seats in Illinois. But in the House, the equation stayed the same. There were still 71 Democrats elected, and we ended up with a minority of Republicans, too. So when you, when you can't move the, the equation politically, uh, when you can't move uh, the changes in the House and Senate through the ballot box, then it's very difficult to make changes on the governmental front, too.